All right. Well, again, thank you all for joining me. I'm Carol Stringer. I'm the Fulton County Agricultural and Natural Resources Agent. Um, I'm based in the North Office in Sandy Springs. We also have offices in East Point. Um, I really hope you guys are into this presentation tonight. I think it's going to be fun, and I just think bulbs are just a really great way to add color to your landscape. So I hope there's something in here that you guys can take away and use in your home gardens. Um, if you have any questions throughout the evening, feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll try to go through them all at the end of the presentation. Um, and there's, I mean, the only other thing that I would point out to you all is there are literally thousands of different kinds of bulbs that we can grow here and um, I'm not an expert on all of them. I will try to address all the questions that you guys have. If, if I don't know an answer, I will let you know. I just don't know. But um, yeah, all right, well then let's go ahead and get started. So um, specialized storage organs often referred to as bulbs. So there are a million different kinds of bulbs out there, but here are the main categories of different kinds of um, storage organs that we consider a bulb. So um, I'm going to go through each one of these a little bit more. So what is a true bulb? A true bulb is a specialized underground storage organ. Um, it has a short fleshy vertical stem axis here, uh, a basal plate down here, and the growing point here in the middle, and um, a flower bud enclosed by these thick fleshy scales. And there's two kinds, there's tunicate and non-tunicate. So the non-tunicates look like this. They have scales, but they don't come all the way to the top. And the tunicates look more like an onion where they come all the way to the point. So within these, you have the modified scales, which are actually a type of leaf. The basal plate, which is the growing point. You had adventitious roots coming down out of the bottom. You have a growing point here in the middle where the young flower is developing and any uh, immature foliage. If you've ever had an onion that sits too long in the storage bin and it starts to send out that green thing coming out the top, that's what's going on here. Um, so this is just a nice diagram to show you kind of the cross section. And here's one of the non-tunicate. Uh, looks to me like an artichoke, although artichokes are not a bulb. Uh, lily bulbs are, are a good example of this. Each scale kind of overlaps, but they don't come all the way to the top. So some bulbs are actually able to produce these little funky things called bulblets. So those are going to be growing right at the top of the base, um, right at that soil line. And these can actually be kind of popped off and taken somewhere else and planted. It may take a few years before those are big enough to actually flower and become mature, but they are a way of propagating these plants. Likewise with the bulb bills, they are aerial bulbs that the plant produces. If you've ever grown tiger lilies and you've seen those little black structures growing along the leaves and stem, and you were just kind of like, what are those? Um, I actually didn't know what they were until quite recently, but they are an aerial bulb, a, a mini bulb that can also be taken away and propagated through that. So corms are another type of storage structure. They are the swollen base of a stem, um, and they do have some leaves. The, the big difference between them and a true bulb is that they have a distinct node and inner node. Um, of course, a node is a growing point on a stalk, and an inner node is the point between the growing points. Now notice these little cormels that come off the side at the nodes. These can also be broken off and taken away as it, once it's a little bit larger and made into a new plant. Tubers are one of the storage structures that we're probably all very familiar with. Uh, if you consider like an Idaho potato is a tuber, technically. They are a modified storage organ that kind of grows off of the root structures, just almost like a tumor. If you've ever grown potatoes, they, when you pull them up out of the ground, there will be normal roots and then these huge clods that are just kind of growing on the roots themselves. And that's, that's a tuber. So other plants grow as tubers as well. Caladiums are a really good example. 
Um, some begonias are that way. Um, it's just another type of storage organ that we use like this. Rhizomes are kind of an interesting one. Um, to me, I always think of them with grasses. So like your traditional Bermuda grass has both, uh, you've ever pulled it up as a kid, you know, you're out there in the yard and you rip it up out of the ground. It has those, what I always call runners. And they have them on top of the ground and below the ground. So the ones on top of the ground are the stolons and the ones below the ground are the rhizomes. But many other plants also make rhizomes. Uh, so a good example, we've got calla lilies and canna here. It's, it's a horizontal underground stem that's growing just below the soil surface. And as it grows along, it can send up more foliage a few inches away or however long you know, that it is. Another good example is the iris. So if you guys are familiar with Siberian irises or um, bearded irises, they are a rhizome or they're, I'm sorry, they're a rhizominous plant. So, and you can see one here right in this picture. So got a couple different terminologies here for you all. So a hardy bulb is one that is able to survive cold climates. A semi-hardy can um, tolerate some cold, but not as much as a hardy bulb. And a tender bulb doesn't tolerate really any freezing at all. So these semi-hardy and tender bulbs, depending on where you are in the state of Georgia, or if you're not from Georgia and you're turning in tonight, um, they will need, depending on your zone, they may need to have a little bit extra protection throughout the winter or be dug up and kind of stored in a place like a garage or something like that over the winter. So Georgia has technically three hardiness zones, but this, this gets confusing because we have actually quite a few more than that whenever it gets broken up into um, A and B of each one. So only a very little piece of Georgia in the very northern part is in the zone six. And then down here, again, in the savannah and the coastal areas, we have some of these 9A. So there's actually a good swath of um, different zones throughout the state. So it's going to be very important for you all to know exactly what zone you fall into. Uh, that's going to really make a big difference on what bulbs do well for you. And I will try to highlight which ones are a little bit more sensitive to the cold. So fall flowering bulbs are the ones that uh, flower in late summer or early fall. Winter flowering bulbs are forced bulbs that are tender and they bloom out of season indoors. If you've ever gotten a gift of daffodils or um, tulips in a glass vase, you know, for Mother's Day or uh, actually that's not the right holiday, it would be uh, earlier than that, Valentine's Day. Um, those are out of season. So they're, they've been forced to bloom at their not peak time. And a few, a very few, um, few bulbs bloom in the uh, very early spring, and those are technically winter flowering. Minor bulbs are small in stature compared to the larger ones, but they have a lot of advantage as an accent plant. They're great for borders, and really just kind of uh, filling in a lot of the blank spaces in your beds. So spring flowering bulbs and summer flowering bulbs actually make up the bulk of this presentation. And I'm sure that this is what you're all thinking of whenever you're getting ready to plant. Spring flowering bulbs are the ones we're getting ready to plant now. Um, we plant them in the fall. They bloom the following spring. And most of these are gonna be hardy throughout the state. Summer flowering bulbs are a bit more of a mixed bag in terms of their hardiness, tenderness, um, exactly when they flower and if they, their sensi temperature sensitivity as well. Site selection is important, although I will say that bulbs are a little less picky than some other flowers. Um, so most of these that we're thinking about right now, the spring flowering bulbs, do well maybe under a tree or something like that, a deciduous tree especially, because in the time of year that they're gonna be blooming, 
the trees haven't leafed out yet. So they do, you know, they get plenty of light in that area. Um, and that's typically one that we see a lot, you know, daffodils under trees or tulips, things like that. Um, and so they're gonna be bringing a little bit of color into your yard at a time of year when a lot of other things are just not showy or green yet. And, and that can be a really nice thing. So the summer bulbs are, again, they're a little bit more finicky. So just make sure that the spot that you select is gonna give those plants the amount of sunlight that they need. So do your research if you're planting something like pannas or, um, begonias, I think are another one in this section, sorry. Um, but just make sure that what you're planting is going to get the amount of light that it needs in that situation. So sometimes if they're not getting enough light, those plants are just not going to flower as showy as they would in, in the ideal conditions. So it's just something to think about. So if you're making a new bed by your house or, you know, reviving an old one, um, we do need to do a little bit of work on our soil. It's not as imperative as if we were doing a vegetable garden. But it is important that we have good, well-drained soil because otherwise you might have rotten bulbs by the time spring rolls around. So good drainage is very essential. If you decide that um, your drainage might, need, might be a little problematic, you can do this quick little test where you dig a hole about a foot deep and you're going to fill it with water and then the next day you come back and you do it again. Uh, and if that time the water is gone within eight hours, you should be good to, go, to grow most bulbs. If you find that it's still lingering and moist there after 10 hours, that soil might not be suitable for bulbs and you may need to do an amendment. Um, I've got a list here of a couple different ones that can really just improve the soil's texture and ability to drain moisture away. So um, bark or compost, vermiculite, peat moss, any of these are gonna be good to help improve that soil texture and drainage. So you don't always have to do um, fertilizer in your beds, that's just a suggestion, um, but it, they do need fertilized sometimes. And if you're creating a bed from scratch, it might be a good idea to do a soil test. So our offices do offer soil testing as a service and you guys are welcome to email me about that later if you have interest in that or contact our offices, but more or less you can bring a sample, a, a couple of scoops of your soil into our office and drop them off and we will send them off to the lab and have them tested for their nutrients and pH content. So a good pH about six to six and a half, 6.8 is good for most bulbs. If you do need to incorporate lime because it's very acidic, it's good to do it in the fall and give some time for those nutrients to be absorbed. If you aren't going to do a soil test, a little bit of fertilizer is not a bad idea. You can add just a little bit of 10-10-10 um, or some low-grade nutrients to the soil just to give it a little extra kick. Um, if you are, you know, you have done this test your soil and you see that it is aesthetic and you did decide to incorporate a little bit of lime or fertilizer, or any other type of amendment, the one thing I do wanna stress is that you need to um, thoroughly mix it down into the soil layer at least to 12 inches. Because remember, bulbs are not sitting right at the top. Typically, they are a little bit lower in the soil profile. So we do want that soil to be loose and loamy and have all the nutrients that those plants need. Now, organic fertilizers are often recommended, but they're not necessarily any superior to inorganic sources as long as those are used correctly. And the other consideration I have here is don't try to work the soil when it's too wet. Um, if you guys know much about vegetable gardening and you've ever tilled up your yard when it's, or I'm sorry, your, your garden when it's wet, it just turns to concrete when the sun comes out. So, um, go out there and take a big handful of your soil and squeeze it between your hands. If it makes one giant hard blob, then it's too wet. Um, but if it crumbles, then it's perfect for digging and planting. So you've 
gone outside, you have your bed already and prepared and fertilized now. Um, now is a good time to go find your bulbs and select what you wanna grow. You figured out how much sunlight you have, everything, you, you're ready. Um, so what you wanna do now is make sure that you purchase your bulbs from a reputable person. Uh, if you're going and you're looking at them in person, make sure that they're not discolored, soft, rotten, or they have any sort of foul odor because that means that they're dead and they're not gonna do very well. Uh, the other thing I would caution you all against is that any bulbs that you, that are spring flowering that you purchase in the spring are just leftovers and they're, they're worthless at that point. So don't, now is the time to buy them. Now is the time to plant them. Don't wait until spring. So bulbs are generally graded and sold according to their size. So if you get a really big, nice bulb, might be a little bit more expensive. Some, uh, some of the flower species we're gonna talk about here are actually, they are much larger in size than others. Some of them are quite small. So that's, that's just one thing to keep in mind. Typically a larger bulb is gonna produce more flowers uh, sooner and um, just take up more space in the landscape. So like I mentioned before, spring flowering bulbs are gonna be planted now, anytime from here until the beginning of December. So if you buy some and, or you order them online and you can't plant them right away, it's always good to store them around 60 degrees in a dry area, like a garage or a basement. You don't want them laying out in the sun, direct sunlight or in a hot area because that may end up actually damaging them. Um, so most of these spring flowering bulbs require this kind of cold period that will help create a nice flower and a really showy spring bloom. Um, so if you're in a place like far south Georgia and you want to try some of those, you might try putting them in the fridge actually for a few weeks before planting them. That might help kind of kickstart them and get them ready to um, make sure that they've met those temperature requirements that they need in order to bloom. So summer flowering bulbs, which we'll also talk about, they're planted in the spring after the danger of frost has passed. So we wouldn't, even though we're gonna talk about them in this, in this presentation, you're not gonna plant them until next spring. So after you've been in the store and you've picked out all your bulbs and you're ready to, to go back to your, to your bed that you've been working on, you need to think about the depth of that bed. So, and, and whatever the bulbs want, where do they wanna grow in the soil profile? So if you see over here on the right, I've got this nice little chart that's got the depths that certain plants like to be at. So some of them like to be as deep as 10 inches. Then you have some up here, irises, um, scylla. These like to be in the top two to three inches up here. They can grow in much more shallow conditions than say the tulips or the daffodils. So keep that in mind. They all like to be at a certain spot and a certain depth. If you decide to do some layering, which I think is so cool, uh, just keep in mind that if you're, whatever you're putting on the bottom, you don't want something that's gonna have to be divided frequently because in order to get back down to those, you're gonna have to cut through multiple layers of flowers. So just keep that in mind as you're doing your layering in the bed. Also think about the space between the bulbs when you're doing the, the layers, you know, not just how deep that they have to be down, but between plants. It's easy to get overzealous, and I am the worst at this, where you just get really excited about stuff and you're like, oh, I'm gonna put everything in here all at once, uh, and it'll be okay. And, and realistically, we need to make sure that we give each bulb enough room to produce the, the plant size that it needs to be. So when it comes up, it just needs to have enough room to grow and thrive. So make sure that the spacing that, you know, you're paying attention, not just to the depth, but also the spacing. So if you are growing any, uh, bulbs like to be directly upright, but if you have any rhizomes, like the irises that I mentioned earlier, they are planted horizontally. So they like to lay completely sideways in the soil. So you've got your bulbs in there, 
pack them down and give them a nice watering to help kind of settle the soil and get them that nice first drink. So throughout the winter, it's always a good idea if you, you know, have some of these more tinder bulbs, you can mulch them. That's one way to kind of help keep that soil intact, prevent erosion, and sort of keep the temperature, kind of incubate those bulbs in the soil. And there's a number of different things you can do, pine straw, bark, um, pine needles, anything like that is gonna be acceptable for that. Some taller plants may need to have stakes just to prevent falling over from high winds, things like that. Um, I will mention that, that once they have come up and flowered, if, if you see on the news that there's going to be a cold snap, there's not a good effective way to prevent, um, to protect those blooms. So if, if they get hit with a frost, they're donezo for the season. And that's okay, it, it happens all the time. Um, it's just part of it for those early spring flowers. Um, also too, just keep in mind, you know, they're down in there in the soil. So if you are digging around, it can be easy to stab them or accidentally cut them in half. And uh, it's also good to fertilize them again after they've flowered. The foliage, a lot of people want to mow the foliage down, but I would really recommend leaving it out there until it dies just on its own. We want that plant to get all, you know, do its photosynthesis as long as it needs to for next year as well. So that way it has enough energy. Summer flowering bulbs are producing their foliage in the spring, and then they'll remain that way until they get that cold weather kill. And the fall flowering bulbs produce foliage typically when spring flowering bulbs do, but they just flower a different time of year. So they're all producing foliage throughout the year and, and dying back. It's just something to consider as you're going through your maintenance. So I really don't think that bulbs need that much extra water. It's always good to water them once you've planted them and when you're trying to establish your bed, but I wouldn't necessarily think that you need to water them excessively unless we're just having a severe drought. And then it's always good to soak the ground really thoroughly and make sure they're getting that water that they need. But normally rainfall is going to provide enough water for them throughout the season. So if you have a green thumb and you like to play with flowers, you've probably divided or propagated some, some bulbs at some point in your life. Um, it's, it's relatively easy and some of them just make more and all you have to do is kind of just gently separate them. Irises again are one that are rhizominous so they need to be cut uh, and they quite readily will grow from those pieces as long as each division has at least one eye on it. Or, and typically I always would recommend that when you're doing something like that, to give each section of the rhizome needs to have a little bit of green growth on it, just to make sure that it, it does survive that cutting and transplanting. So if you have some tender bulbs, and we're gonna go through a few here in a while, if you have some that are tender and they need to be dug up in the fall and stored in, in your garage or basement over the, the winter, you want to store them in a dry place away from sunlight and with good air circulation. So you want to be just dry, not humid where they might have a tendency to rot or anything like that. Then in the spring you need to go through them and remove any that might be kind of mushy looking or rotten in any way. Um, so it's just this is just a common practice that with those tinder bulbs that you'll end up doing if you have any of those in your yard. So this is just something to think about and I think this is really neat and it is very showy and attractive but you can naturalize your bulb. Some of these that we're going to talk about today have the ability to self-spread and kind of you know continue to be bigger and bigger each year you can create these little areas in your yard where they're just kind of wild and doing their own thing um, by either digging shallow trenches and putting some bulbs in 
or you can randomly scatter some of the small bulbs like daffodils and crocus on the ground and the leaves will kind of insulate them and they'll pop up in the spring. Um, some people like to insert small bulbs under the thatch of, the, of your lawn, which is really neat, but I just want to caution you if you do any kind of like weed and seed or weed killer on your turf, so that's not a good idea because it will also kill your flowers. But if you don't do that, they can be pretty cool to have come up in the early spring. So we did mention this earlier, some bulbs can be forced to bloom out of season, which can be really nice and cheerful in the winter months when you don't have a lot of color. Um, so here's a list of a few that do the best with that. Tulips are probably the one that you see most often, daffodils. There's a few others as well. Um, pot them in October and then keep them in a dark area such as a garage or basement, or even a refrigerator is okay if you don't have a good cold area and you just don't want them to dry out. And then after a period of time, you, you pull the pot back out into a well-lighted area that's a little bit, still cool, but a little warmer than your refrigerator, you know. And then after about a month of watering them and caring for them in that sunlit area, they're gonna pop up and have some flowers for you. I definitely think that it is a fun thing to do. The only downside to doing this is that when you force them to bloom out of season, it they have to be discarded. They're not useful to plant again in the landscape. So I'm not gonna talk on this too much, but I do wanna mention that with all of our ornamental plants, diseases and insects can of course always be a problem. So good, good cultivation, um, making sure that you maintain your plants appropriately. You're not planting too many of them close together. Um, you're inspecting them frequently for insects or slugs, things like that. That's the most important thing to do. You know, you're, you're watching your plants and if you see a problem, then you can address it immediately. But typically, it's not something that you're gonna have to deal with as much as with other things, I don't think. But if you do see an issue, it's definitely worth, you know, you can send us a picture and we can help you out and give you some, some suggestions on that control. So now I'm going to go through some recommended bulbs and types for your gardens. Um, again, if you guys remember back to that zone chart, we're going to talk about that a little bit more depending on where you are in the state. Some of these may be more tender and more, and some of them may be more hardy. So just keep that in mind when you're shopping around for bulbs. And again, I will stress that I haven't personally grown every single one of these, but I have grown several of them. Um, and these are just really the highlights of the ones that I thought were the most attractive and some of the better quality. So each slide, I'm just gonna give you a brief, a little bit of kind of blurb about each one. And each one is also gonna have these, um, categories of information. So we have the hardiness, whether they're tender, semi-hardy or hardy, the planting time with fall or spring, the depth and the spacing. So we'll start out with our spring flowering bulbs since that's probably what most of y'all are the most interested in. Um, so alliums, if you guys have ever seen these, they're really cool. They come up and they produce a nice big puff ball of purple and they're just a nice, globe of flowers. They're very whimsical. Um, they come in a variety of heights and shades of purple. There's also a couple white varieties out there. They're good for a background because they're very stalky. So they kind of come up and they make a big puff at the end of a, a long stalk. They are part of the allium genus. So that's most known for, you know, it's a cousin of onions and garlic uh, shallots, all of those are kind of closely related plants. And if you know, if you've done any gardening before and you've ever let those plants go to seed, they make a flower that looks not unlike this. So they all have kind of similar characteristics. So again, it's hardy, plant it in the fall, more just deep, between six to 18 inches apart from each other. So anemone, 
These come in a really wide variety of colors. They're small and they make nice compact mounds, which makes them good for a border or um, kind of a front position in front of some taller bulbs or other plants. So there are some that bloom a little bit later as well, these uh, poppy anemones. So they, they come in a lot of different colors, they can be good. These are again, hardy, fall planted and a relatively small bulb. Snowdrops, these come up in, the, in nice little low growing mass of, of flowers. And if you remember, this is one of the ones that can also be forced. Um, they have a nice drooping flower. They do grow really well in sort of these wooded areas or around deciduous trees where they're going to get that early spring sunlight. And they emerge very early in the season as well. Glory of the Snow, another small flower that's good for mass planting or planting in front of your other taller plants. They are good for naturalizing, so they will self-seed and self-increase. So if you have an area that you want them to kind of spread, I want some flowers to kind of mass out over time, these would be a good contender. Uh, they are hardy, all planted, again, small bulbs, two to three inches, two inches deep, three inches apart. Crocus is one of my favorites and they're uh, a really fine little flower, and very cheerful. They come in a wide variety of colors and they're very tiny and they just come up a few inches out of the soil and just pop a little flower open, which is really nice because typically they're one of the earliest flowers to come out. Uh, so normally there's not a lot of other color that early in the spring and it's just nice to see this little kind of blooming area around your sidewalk or something like that and they can be quite cheerful. So there are fall blooming varieties too and I'll touch on them in the end. They do naturalize, which is great, and they'll kind of self-propagate and self-spread. Winter aconite is a nice, very, very early flowering plant. Again, it's another one that's slow growing, uh, one of the first blooms to come out, and it's a nice bright sunny yellow. It's another one that's hardy and fall planted as well. So fritillaria is a funky plant and I do not have any experience growing them myself, but I'm very intrigued by their strange growth and uh, this sort of showy grass crown that they produce. And then the flowers themselves are pointed towards the ground. So they have these nice droopy flowers and these reddish colors. Uh, they're very showy. They're definitely an underutilized plant and they're not uh, often seen in home gardens, but they're one that does well here and should be investigated if you think they're pretty cool. Um, so yeah. Grape hyacinth, this is one many of you are probably familiar with. It's a, to me, an old timey flower that really just seems Reminds me of Easter and the early spring, you know, another one that seems like it's forced sometimes and you'll see it at grocery stores. It's very easy to grow and naturalizes quickly and will self spread. And it seems like it's mostly in shades of purple, although there are some white varieties available. It's another one that's going to be good for the kind of your front of your flower bed because it is a shorter plant. So irises are really cool and I love them and my mom grows a whole bunch of them in our house back in Kentucky and there's a number of different types, wildly diverse genus, okay, so we have two groups here that we're going to talk about, the bulbous irises and the rhizomatous iris. The rhizomatous are the more familiar types. But there are these really neat uh, bulb irises that are more like woodland style. They are very tiny and short, and they come up and just make a nice flower right there, just a few inches above the soil. They can be very showy. But most of us are probably fam more familiar with the Siberian, Japanese, and bearded irises. These come up and they're quite tall, and they make a nice, dense foliage background. So it's, these are good if you have some other low-growing flowers kind of in front of them. The Siberians do really well in these nice lush clumps. 
And I think that irises are probably one of the most indestructible, hardy plants that you can grow. And they're, they have a really showy bloom also. So I think they're a great one if you've never grown them. They do really well. I will say that they do not bloom as well as if, if they're in a shady spot and they're not getting quite as much sun as they need, they won't give you those really robust flowers that you would get in other situations. So spring star flower, here's one of those that I mentioned that sometimes people put it under their turf thatch, which I thought is really interesting. So again, it's one that will naturalize really quickly and spread, which is fun because it pops up and it's just this lovely lush wave of white flowers. But again, if you are going to use it in a turf situation, always remember that um, if you use any kind of weed and feed fertilizer, something like that on your turf, it's going to damage your plants, your, your star flower plants. So they're one that can be good in a border or in one of those naturalized settings, but just take care if you are going to put it under your lawn. Okay, daffodils are another one of those old timey flowers that everyone knows and we've all grown them probably, but they're really cheerful and quite a nice flower for early spring when there's just not a lot of other color. To me, these are really what I think of when I think of spring flowers. So they definitely have their value in the landscape. I will say that it does get confusing because the daffodils, jonquils, narcissus, they're all part of the division of the narcissus genus. The good thing is that you treat them all the same and, and there's not a lot of differences between their cultivation and practices, but their um, genetic divisions are quite interesting and kind of complicated for us general homeowners. But um, they do come in a lot of nice colors and these sort of variations of cream and white and orange and yellow. So they can be a nice one for early spring as well. So Scylla I just think is really cool because it's got this really, really potent bright blue that is uh, somewhat unusual. You don't see a ton of blue flowers out there. Um, so they're another one that kind of resembles snowdrops to me. They come up and they have these sort of downward turned flowers. Um, but they're another one that's good for naturalizing. They like sort of the shady woodland areas. They do spread over time and they're sort of low growing to the ground. So they're another one that's going to be good for like an accent area. Tulips are probably the most famous bulb ever. So if you, if you don't know very much about tulips, I definitely encourage you to take some time and read about the history of tulips just on your own. And, and it is the most fascinating thing about plants that you'll ever come across. It's just so strange. So in the 15 and 1600s, the Dutch, of course, created tulips. They had for lack of a better word, almost like a bulb stock market where they had a economic panic and people were buying these tulips for exorbitant prices. And of course their market eventually crashed and left a lot of people out of money. It's just wildly interesting. So definitely take a moment and read about that at some time if you have interest in that kind of historical situation. But there are thousands, thousands of types of tulips and they come in a wide variety of colors, of um, variation on their petals, of frills, of all kinds of different stuff. They are a really, really wide group. They possess a lot of genetic variation, which is how we get all these different colors through selective breeding. They are a really nice cut flower. I will make one detractant here that tulips are not as persistent here in the southeast as they are in northern climates. And, and that's true over time as well in those areas as well too. So over time they will kind of start to get less um, showy and produce less flowers each year with age, but they are really, really nice, super potent, like just bright flowers. So I, I do really like them. So here's another funky one called rain lilies. And some of you may be fair, uh, relatively familiar with them. 
They are native to the Americas, but they are one that will come up actually in the summer um, after a big heavy rainstorm and they'll just burst up and have these lovely white flowers. I think they're very cool and they actually come in a variety of pinks and reds as well. So they might be one that you consider adding to your, um, to your garden buds as well. So summer and autumn snowflake are another one that we, we, they actually bloom in the summer, but we plant them now because they're a hardy bulb. And they're kind of similar to the scylla and the um, snowdrops where they're gonna come up and have those little bell-shaped flowers um, kind of flopped over. Another one that's good for naturalizing in a bed and as a border. So now let's talk about some summer flowering bulbs. So this is one that absolutely mystifies me. Amaryllis is, to me, an indoor plant that blooms at Christmas, but you can actually grow them outdoors, which is quite interesting to me, and I would definitely experiment with this. Um, they are tender, so they're one that you can put outside and you can plant them in the fall, um, but they do need to be kind of mulch and cared for a little bit when they're grown in the outdoors. So, and if you've ever seen them in a pot, they're, the top portion of the bulb is sitting in the, it's kind of sitting out of the soil. But when you put them outdoors, you need to cover them a little bit and get them a little bit more protected. So caladiums are another one that's really nice. This one is grown, unlike the other ones we've talked about so far, it's grown for its foliage. So they come in a really wide variety of color combinations and shapes, but they are a nice way to add some, some texture and color into a shady area. But they are a tender bulb. They do need to be dug up in the fall. So Agapanthus is another one of these really cool plants that I personally really like. They are kind of similar to like an allium and a iris. They, they produce these really big stalks with a huge flower ball, for lack of a better word, and, um, and they're blue or white, if you can find a white one, but typically they're blue. So they're a really nice color that's kind of unusual, but they are tall, taller, so they would need to go in the back of your bed. They are semi-hardy in Georgia, so again, I'm in the Atlanta area. Depending on where you are in Georgia, you need to consult the zones for agapanthus. Zone seven is really the top of the edge for them. They don't do as well in zone six or higher. They just, they just won't persist and they can get winter killed. So candles are really ubiquitous. We see them all over the place, but that's because they do good and they love our hot weather here in Georgia. They do really well in that humid summer conditions um, and they have a long bloom time. So they come in a really wide variety of colors and there's, also, there's even ones that have burgundy foliage. I don't know if you all have seen that or they have variegated foliage as well as you know different colored flowers. So there are some, there's a lot of variation with them and they uh, can be very showy. They are extremely tall so it's one you're going to want to have against a building or at the back of your flower bed, but they're just very nice and give, you know, they can really lend an air of tropicalness to your patio. Um, so they're kind of fun. They are semi hardy. So I've got this point here that in zone eight or below, they're going to be okay to leave in the ground. And so it, we consider Atlanta here to be kind of on the edge of zone eight and zone seven. So that's at your discretion. For those of you above Atlanta, I would probably lift them in the fall and kind of store them either in your, you know, your garage or your basement, somewhere cool and dry for the winter. So gladiolus are an, a fun cut flower. They, um, they're good if you plant them in sort of succession planting, that way they're gonna come up in different times but they're not super winter hardy in this area. So they're another one that probably should be lifted in the fall if you're above the Atlanta area. And they do like to have soil mounded around the base of their plant. So they are quite tall and they sometimes need a little bit of support, especially after a rainstorm. 
but they're a really lovely cut flower and they come in a lot of different colors. So that's just one way that you could add some tall color to the back of your, of your flower bed. And again, all these summer ones are planted in the spring. That's what the S is for. So Asiatic lilies are another one that's really fun. They're a good cut flower. They come in a wide variety of heights, a wide variety of colors and variegation. They're very fragrant. Uh, they're a really nice flower. They do need some support, especially the tall ones. They tend to grow, if you can see in this picture, it's kind of, they, they'll grow just one huge stalk that'll come straight up and then have a flower at the top. This one looks like a dwarf to me, but if you normally, they'll come up and have a huge flower just at the very end. So they can be really top heavy. But um, yeah, if you plant them in mass, they're really nice. They're a very showy, very fragrant flower that does good as a cut. So dahlias, this is interesting as well. They're typically grown as what I think of as a spring flower bed plant that you would buy like an annual in a flat, but you can actually keep them over the winter. Um, so many of the cut types are propagated by root division. They are one that you do need to dig up and keep over the winter in a cool area. They're not one that's gonna be winter, reliably winter hardy. Magic lilies, if you guys aren't familiar with these, I, I am, I really, really like magic lilies because they're so weird. You know, you just uh, completely forget about them and you're living your life and suddenly it's the end of July and after a rain, there will just be this freak plant that just appears and it just pops up out of nowhere. I mean, seemingly overnight and they produce these lovely flowers at the top and the only ones that I've ever seen have been in this pale pink color. So I'm, forgive me, I'm not actually sure if they come in other colors, but they are really cool and, and they grow very quickly and provide a really brief shot of color in um, mid, like true midsummer. So they're really fun just because they grow so quickly. Their foliage actually grows in the early spring, and then by the time they're blooming, they, the foliage is gone. So this is another one that's actually fall planted, and they are hardy here. Just wanted to highlight that distinction. So tuberous begonias are another one that's very lovely, comes in a wide variety of colors and uh, leaf shapes and colors in the foliage as well. Um, they are a tuber. So these are a little bit more difficult. You do need to pre-sprout sprout the tubers indoors to increase that length of the growing season. Um, and they like to be planted very shallowly close to the soil surface, but they are, keep in mind, a tender annual, I'm sorry, a tender bulb. So they need to be removed again in the fall. They're planted in, this, in the spring. So you've got them, you know, you're getting them started in the early, early spring. You put them outside, lift them again in the fall. So criniums are a real traditional old flower. They are um, often found, some people have said that they find them in graveyards or old homesteads. They can be really big. So I would restrict them, you know, do your research on the variety that you're gonna plant and restrict them to one area because they can actually grow quite tall. And they produce a number of different colored flowers depending on what variety you get. But they are another one that's really cool and they come, they produce, I'm sorry, they make a very large bulb. So one that's big and showy, good for an, a large area. And these can be planted in spring or fall, but they are hardy here, especially in South Georgia and more south you go. So two pearls, this one actually makes me sad a little bit because they are really fragrant and lovely, but this one um, has become so associated with funerals that its popularity has declined, which is really sad because they are very fragrant um, and a very superb cut flower. So they grow pretty well here. I would typically treat it as a tender bulb, meaning that you need, again, it doesn't tolerate freezing. You need to lift it in the fall if you're in North Georgia. In South Georgia, you might be able to get away with it, leaving it out in the winter. So finally, I'm gonna wrap up with just a few bulbs that flower in the fall. There's a lot fewer types that do this. 
but there are a couple. And if you guys remember the crocus from, from earlier in the presentation, this is the autumn version of the crocus. So they look very similar to the spring crocus. They're very low growing, but they bloom in the fall. And, and typically they're a white or lilac color and they appear very rapidly, have this nice low growing flower. So they're hardy, fall planted, and fall blooming. So red spider lily and yellow spider lily are gonna be similar to the magic lilies. I don't have as much experience with these, but they are a very similar plant and they come up kind of rapidly. They just bloom later in the season than the magic lily. So if you like the red and the yellow colors better than that pink, that might be something to look into. And then finally, we have winter daffodil, which is called, which is Stenbergia. And they're very underused bulb, but they are really cool. And they produce these very tiny, cute little flowers, very low growing and close to the ground. Um, and they look very similar to autumn crocus, but they do well and they'll naturalize and kind of spread over time. So here's a really extensive list of additional bulbs that we didn't go over. Um, and what I'm actually going to do for everyone here is I have this publication and I'm going to drop this in the chat for everybody. Here we go. Chat box. Okay. Okay, so this publication, you all, I really encourage you all to go to this and get a copy of it um, because it's the publication version of this PowerPoint. So it lists all the different bulbs. It gives you all the information about whether they're hardy or tender, um, when to plant them, and it goes in more depth than I could have covered in an hour and includes way more flowers. So you guys should definitely take a look at that and uh, see if there's, you know, for follow-up information. So now I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen. And let's see here. Or actually I can keep sharing it, it doesn't matter. And take on a few guys' questions. So I'm going to the chat box here. Okay, so it says, if I dig up my caladium bulbs now, can I save them to replant next summer? So caladiums, I'm going to reference here for you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak out of turn. They are, they're tender. So depending on where you are in Georgia, I would definitely dig them up now. So this is a good time of the year as the temperatures are declining, if you have any of these tinder bulbs and you want to save them over the winter, now would be the time to do so. So, and Carol also asks, hello Carol, I'm also Carol. Um, so when you say lift it and put it in the garage, do you ever water them? So I would not. So typically you are going to dig them up and if I was going to do it, I would clean them up a little bit, remove any kind of rotten parts or anything like that. And I would put them in something like newspaper or, um, you know, shredded newspaper or sawdust. You can do something like that and just put them in a bin and just let them hang out in your garage and they'll be good to go. Kind of gives them a false dormancy period. And that, that's what I would probably do. So I would encourage you to pull them out of the soil. I wouldn't just put the pot inside. Although, depending on how hardy it is, that might work just as well. Oh, somebody says we get, we also get the magic lily here in Australia. So hello. Yeah, magic lilies are really cool. I'm glad to see that you guys have it in other places as well. So does anyone have any other questions for us in regards to different bulbs or anything else I can help you with this evening. Again, you all should reference the publication. I really encourage everybody to open that link before we close out our session because that way you haven't lost it. Although you can always email me later if you come up with other questions or want to back reference it, but it has a lot more information that I was able to cover here. So I really wanted to make sure everyone had it. Oh, thank you, Doris. Appreciate that. My Lycoris, yellow and red are blooming right now. That's cool, very neat. So. 
bleeding hearts, a rhizominous plant. Nancy, I have no idea. I think they are, um, that's a really good question. I think that they're, I'm trying to, we used to grow them and I'm trying to think if we ever divided them. I think they're just a typical perennial, although that's something I'm going to have to look up. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Bleeding heart. Bulbs that would come up through ivy. So ooh, depends on what kind of ivy you have. Ivy can be really um, aggressive and can typically be growing in areas that are more um, more shady or uh, sloped. So I, if you're going to try it, I would try something that's tall and it's going to die back. Are day lilies treated the same as other lilies? So day lilies are not a bulb. They're kind of rhizominous like the irises. So they can be lifted and, and snipped and um, spread that way as they, as if you've ever divided them, they do kind of have like that rhizominous tuber growth that you can cut and uh, spread throughout your garden. And honestly, I think daylilies are another one of those super indestructible bulbs that, or not a bulb, plant, that um, they're like a throw and grow. They just keep going and it seems like they're hard to kill. Oh, Doris has answered the question. She says that she has crocus and daffodil coming in around in between her English ivy. So there's, there's some uh, tips there for you. You guys are, more, of course, more than welcome to try it. I would just say that ivy can be really aggressive and might overtake your, they might suffocate your bulbs. So just keep that in mind. All right, well, if we don't have any more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my recording. Thank you all for joining me this evening. I really appreciate it. And if you guys have more questions, you're welcome to um, email me. I'll put my...